Hello, and welcome to That One Idea, a podcast series chronicling early stage founder journeys brought to you by Waterbridge Ventures. Through this podcast series, we hope to bring up the founder moments and journeys that lead them to starting up. We highlight the humans behind the founders as they blitz through the zero to one scale journey and transition their ideas into scale worthy businesses. These conversations reveal the unique spirit and talent of these incredible founders as they share their vision of who they are and what they're building. In today's episode, we have Ashish Jain in conversation with Ankit Bagaj, co-founder of Loopworm. Loopworm specializes in extracting proteins from insects. Yes, you heard it right, protein from insects. The team wants to solve for sustainable, traceable and scalable supply of protein alternatives. Let's hear from Ankit on what it takes to build when both the space and venture is at an early, nascent stage. Hello Ankit and welcome to this podcast. Thanks for sparing time and coming to our office for this podcast. You are looking great and all charged up. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you for having me. So just to start, like what it takes to basically build something which is this new in India. So there are a number of challenges, obviously, that is there in every startup journey. But then you get a lot of analogous startups who you can get inspiration from whose journey you can track and basically execute as your own as well. But that was not the case for us. We realized it very in the very beginning that it's not a conventional startup idea, which is VC fund. And to make it large, we needed to do that proof of concept at a good level so that the, the investors are convinced that, yes, this can work at a scalable stage. And that was the, the, the first thing that we decided that like we are not going to run for equity money very early on in our journey. We are going to take, take our time, do our R&D, do our proof of concept, build that capabilities in terms of growing insects, breeding them, and also processing them before like taking the, taking the next step or propelling ourselves to the next step with the help of venture money. Great. No, that's great. Excellent. So Abhi and you have known each other since your early days at IIT Rurki. Do you think having known each other for a long period of time eases your journey as co-founders? Yes, definitely it does. There is that element of trust. You know each other's strengths and weaknesses. You know what the other person likes and dislikes. And then ultimately it's easier to, to understand and go through a situation. Because then you know whose domain it falls in whose trends lie in that particular domain. And then like there are lesser feuds, there are quicker conversations, there are quicker decision making, and you basically are faster in your decision making process. And that definitely helps. What also helps is that like apart from just the work, like since you know the person from the very beginning, there is that informal relationship that you have with with him or her. So basically it, it helps during the the, the phases, the, the down phases, right? Where it's not working out on your part. The other person is there, there to help and support you. And that, that actually helps instead of just a formal relationship or a work-related relationship. Yeah, and, and how does it impact your like the freshness within the whole thing? Because does it make it too predictable and you know, okay, you know, this is how the other person is going to react? Sometimes it does happen. And... What you can do before the discussion, because you know that person, you can be prepared with those discussion points or those pain points that you know are going to come. Right. So that, that is where I told you that you can predict what that person might be okay with, might not be okay with, and ultimately shape up your discussion points accordingly so that you reach the discussion, uh, the decision make very quickly. And that, that actually helps. The predictiveness sometimes hampers us because what happens is like, like we are not thinking outside the box sometimes. We genuinely sit and give ourselves those time that now we have to think outside the box and not the conventional thing that we have been discussing. We both stay together as well. So there is work related discussion all the time. So ultimately, like what we have to do then is do the do the disc, like the jotting down the discussion points separately and then sit together for a discussion. And then like we lay it down, like two hours, we are going to get out of this room and ultimately come out with, with some, some conclusion and that helps. And then ultimately we, we take it up with you and Mark and that, that actually helps as well. So yeah, that, that is how it works. 
Great. So one of you is quite an optimist and the other one is more realist. So does it aid or hamper your day-to-day or strategic decision making or execution? Yeah, so optimist and realist or like realist and pessimist could could be the two ways you can put it together. So yeah, it it does matter a lot. Um, Actually, so and we are both optimists in different ways and we are both realists in different ways. So when it comes to say operations, like what, what is going on currently, right? So Abhi is really an optimist there and I'm the one who is acting as a pessimist, like, and so just figuring out or just jotting out the things, what can go wrong, mm. right? And he's the one who's like, no, we can figure it out. And when it comes to say R and D or something, which is going to come in the future, right? That is where I am more optimist and, and he's a bit more pessimist there and and that actually helps us because it's our domain operations is his domain r and d is something that i look into and it's better that like we have somebody like who's thinking the opposite way what if it doesn't work out what if it like what if we lose money while doing this this r and d what if the market is not ready for such a product right and i should be like prepared with those type of answers because those are going to come and those are important for the business and similarly, on the operation standpoint, right, a number of things can go wrong. We are building a factory, we are growing and processing insects, right? So, like, there are there is extra precaution which is required because we are entering a new domain. If something happens, some mishap happens, right? The, the entire industry would be questioned, and that, that is basically going to take away something very beautiful that India can lead on, which is insect agriculture and processing. Um, so, yeah, we have the leaders here. We should like behave like the leaders and we should like take that responsibility as well because yes, India can definitely produce insects and process insects for the world. And that's great to hear from you, Ankit. That's really nice. So as you mentioned you know, just a moment ago, you have spent significant time in researching and optimizing the protein extraction process. This must have been a journey with ups and downs. How was it and how is it helping you now build loop for more efficiently than anyone else so if you look at in any biotech or deep tech based startup so there is the science part or science element of it and then there is the engineering element of it where you take it up to the scale so in that sense we had to divide the two journeys so it was first the science part for us where a lot of entomology or a lot of biology kicked in like which we have zero background of uh, so, like, it was a lot of first principle thinking that we did, a lot of reading from our side, understanding what is going on across the world, doing all sorts of jugars to get the information that we needed, not just secondary information from the internet, but the primary information. What is working out? What is not working out? And why is the is the real question here? Why is something working or not working out? Why is, say, global com- why are global companies getting that kind of money? or for something which is in the primary and the secondary sector, which is which is something that VCs that normally don't look into. But so th- th- those were the questions. And the decision that we took was something unconventional. Like instead of getting a background expert in our team at that stage, like basically getting an entomologist who studies insects at that stage, what we thought was that like if we basically like do the biology part ourselves or try to understand it ourselves, do it practically, what is going what it is going to help us with is when we execute it at scale with engineering. Because that is where our backgrounds come in. That like once we have figured out the science, engineering is something that we can build on top of it. And that has helped us tremendously. Because the way we farm and process insects is different than than the rest of the world. Yeah. And how long did it take for you to like do the research and what part of research was critical for you to, you know, feel confident that now we, you have reached a stage where you can approach the market to raise money and to do and expand and, you know, think about commercialization. There are four major steps in an insect agriculture and processing activity. You have to breed the insects, you have to incubate their eggs, you have to farm the insects, basically grow them just like you do fish farming. And the fourth step is processing these insects. Obviously, you have to work on the productivity and the yield part of each of these steps. And that was challenging because when we started, there's a 
fundamental ratio that the insect industry uses called bioconversion ratio, which is the amount of food waste you put in and the amount of live larvae you can get out by, by feeding them that food waste. And this ratio was around 10% for us when we started. Currently, we are at around 22%, uh, which, which makes all the difference in the world because that's our significant cost. Of, of production and that's that's what was required breeding like if you want to do a couple of cultures of eggs it's okay but if you want to do kgs of eggs is something which is challenging so you have to streamline those breeding process you are basically trying to create an artificial environment for the flies to do something which they don't do naturally and like if you can see your dog like the dog basically shows the behavior, whether he is feeling well or not, whether he is consuming the food well, whether he is active or not. But the insect don't show that. Um, you just have to rely on your hunch and on your results, and like just work on it again and again and again. And so that 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 part, those parts were difficult. Breeding in itself was 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 a difficult thing because we cannot rely on the natural cultures that we get. Could be our starting cultures. But then ultimately, we, are, we have to be independent of the natural cultures. We need to have our own breeding apparatus, breeding systems, uh, solve for strains, because that is going to bring in that productivity. Simultaneously, insects in the baby stage or like in the incubation stage have a very high mortality normally. So solving for that mortality was important because if the incubation is not sorted, even if the breeding is very efficient, we are not going to get the results. And at the end, farming, farming insects uh, is a challenging task um, because what happens is you have to optimize the amount of food waste or the feedstock that you are putting in, the amount of insects that you are trying to grow in that particular small system or a crate. You basically use milk crates, stack them on top of each other so that like we save on the space. And it's a mobile system where the, the crates can basically be carried to, to the places for further processing and treatment. Processing was simpler for us. We had been reading on it for a very long time. Like I said, first principle thinking there as well. And it paid off. It paid off really well. At that point of time, like we started getting confident more and more and more till the time we reached the processing stage. And once we hit the processing stage, did it for say like six months, then we were confident that yes, now we can take it to the next stage. And yeah, so that was the journey. And, and uh, since you mentioned, and that's an important point, that it is unusual space when it comes to VCs looking into this space. So while you were researching and you were planning to raise money and you were, how confident you were that you will be actually be able to raise money from these? And what, what do you think it actually helped you to you know, get this money? So like it was a lot of ups and downs when we started i was really pumped up that actually falls in my domain pitching two vcs and all because like i've won a lot of college competitions college pitch competitions and i thought it would be similar but i was heavily wrong there it's it's way different in comparison to those college pitch competitions where the quality quality of the pitch matters but here what matters is like whether or not you are able to go through and reach that person and address those questions which is basically bugging him or her right it's not your entire pitch it's those three questions or four questions which is going to be make or break for you so yeah when i started i was really pumped up i was like yeah i'm going to just go on and do it like just like i was doing it in in my college days and then there was a lot of reality check what actually like we realized is that the vcs are simply not connecting with the problem statement right nobody bothers what we are trying to feed to an animal right no like a lot of them don't even know what a chicken is being fed or what a like a fish or a shrimp is being fed like how do you make the feed is something which is not clear and that is where like being in the ingredient space for animal nutrition makes our life more and more difficult because there is no connection point at the end of the mm -hmm. day the other the person sitting on the other side of the table is a human and that human connection point was missing and then what we realized is there has to be those touch points and what helped us is the antibiotic resistance problem which everybody is aware of it was like widely discussed in COPE 26 in Glasgow 
right, where animal agriculture is the main source of antibiotic resistance. And that can be solved with the help of insect protein inclusion. And that's what connected to them. So say, for example, you're eating an egg and ultimately that, that egg has been produced by a chicken fed with antibiotics. Just because it, like, it acts like a growth promoter, it's, it's so silly that people are using antibiotics as growth promoters. And ultimately, they need the same productivity now. They are habitual of their productivity. So their productivity cannot change. So antibiotics cannot just vanish from the system. It has to be replaced with something natural, something that doesn't harm the, the chicken or in the end the humans consuming their products. And th that was one connection point. The second connection point was a lot of the VCs that we interacted with had pets. So our products can go into dog and cat nutrition as well. And like since we, we had those toxicology studies and the product quality testings done, I was very confident to basically just demonstrate that, yes, I can eat my own insect powder as well. <laughs> it's a human grade insect protein powder for your pets. So rest assured, we are giving you the best quality. And because quality matters for pet parents, it's not just a it now, it's a he or a she for a dog, right? And that, that is what is coming in. So like the, the pet parents basically requires the best, best quality nutrition. And what bothers them is when the dog is at their old age, when the puppy is not growing, when there are stool issues or renal issues, right? And like that is something which we can solve with insect proteins because it is hypoallergenic or it doesn't cause any allergic reactions. It's a lean source of sustainable animal protein. And sustainable and animal doesn't go hand in hand, like, like most of the industries determine. But since like our insects consume organic byproducts, it's sustainable. Since like they're cold-blooded animals, ultimately the protein is lean. It's easier to digest. The digestibility is really high. So those quality parameters was, were just not getting through to them. But then these two things actually connected with what also worked for us is like taking the other way around. So I've spoken to many of my founder friends before I started raising. They told me that like you should try to get the lead investor first. I tried that approach. It didn't work out for me. What I did instead was reach, started reaching out to companies and the founders that I admire. Somebody who are some, someone who is in my network, say from IIT Roorkee. And like those people who have raised like three, four, rounds of funding, know the process. So I started reaching out to them and then I, what I realized is they helped me refine the pitch. They helped me get through to the investor. They helped me with their connects and also like they promoted me or motivated me with their money or their commitments. So there were n number of soft commitments that I got from many of my seniors from IIT Rootkey who are into different segments, a few of the industry stalwarts as well like backing us, gave me that confidence that yes, I'm just not get, get quit getting through to the VCs, like, but it, it is going to happen and then it eventually happened. Great, great. Now you yourself, I'm sure, is are an inspiration for your college juniors and they'll look up to you and your guidance on how to raise VC money in an unconventional way. <laughs> Happy to help them anytime, like the, the ecosystem should grow. Hope no one asked you to actually consume the protein powder and show them the evidence that it works. I do it myself. Nobody asks me to do it. But yes, like 1.3 billion people are actually consuming insect products across the world. Yeah. I can be one of them. <laughs> Great. So this brings us to an interesting point. And since you also mentioned about sustainability, so let's let's first try to understand what is this entire alternate protein space about and why is traceability to source and sustainability becoming so critical? So animal based proteins, they supply staple proteins to 5.5 billion people across the world. The majority population is not actually vegan, consumes animal based protein. We just happen to stay in a very dairy vegan oriented country, but it's not the majority. Um, also, 2 billion people are dependent on fish for their staple forms of protein. And that is where feeding the animals who are giving us food becomes very important because the demand is just growing, not just with the population increase, but with also like a, the choice improvement or the choice change which the younger generations are bringing in. 
right? They are going away from religious belief. They are going away from orthodox, breaking those barriers and becoming the first meat eaters in their family. And that is where animal agriculture is seeing like a significant growth, like in comparison to just the population growth in the entire. And that is where animal nutrition becomes important because it's like an industry. Like you, have, it's it's a fact. Like it's a factory basically giving you food and that is how it should be where productivity and yield becomes very important. Immunity benefits becomes very important because you cannot afford mortality in your farms. And that is where quality ingredients are required to make those compound feeds. So what do a normal feed manufacturer do? It procures like 10 to 15 ingredients, mixes it in the right promotion, proportions, create a balanced diet for a particular species, for a particular life stage, and then supply it to the farmers through distributors. Now the constraint here is the conventional ingredients which are being used in animal nutrition space are all dependent on natural resources in some form or the other. Say for example, soya bean, where 97% of the, so of the farm soya bean is being used in animal nutrition alone, like requires arable land, requires a lot of potable water. And here what you are trying to create is a very unsustainable food system. Yes, you are dependent on soya bean, we cannot go away with soya bean. Like, but you can definitely question the unsustainability there. Because what is happening is, you are growing food for the animals who are giving you food. And there is multiple levels of inefficiencies here. Instead, if hypothetically, if the animal can be fed something else, which is not stressing our natural resources, then the same land can be used to grow the food crops that we can consume directly. Whereas the animal can be fed something else and still the amount of food in the market or in the entire system increases. And that is where animals and humans are actually competing for this arable land and potable water. Similarly, there is another commodity called fish meal. So in the animal nutrition space, the word meal basically means a defatted concentrated protein. And here fish meal means that you go into the seas and the oceans, you bring in trawler loads of fish, you defat them. Whatever is left as a solid is basically an, a concentrated protein powder which goes into aquaculture again. So it's like a fish in fish out mechanism where wild fish is being fed to farmed fish. Now the problem with that is wild fish is limited in quantities in our seas and the oceans. And due to the rise of and sudden rise of aquaculture, the amount of fish in the marine ecosystems is like not regenerating. So 90% of our seas and oceans are now overfished. So we are going to have lesser and lesser and lesser number of fish day by day or year by year. And that is where the crunch in fish meal production is going to come. Indian government has already like deregulated or regulated the fish meal production in India. And that is going to happen across the world. So what is happening is that there is a definite need of an alternative protein source, an alternative fat source, which is sustainable in nature, like which is not stressing our natural resources, which is available in bulk quantities or can be produced in bulk quantities, and which is also high quality. Because at the end of the day, it has to support the yield and productivity for these farmed animals. Yep. And that is where the entire concept of insect protein and insect fats come into play. And in terms of wider environmental benefits, whether it is related to emission norms and other things, and can you can you shed light on the wider you know, environmental benefits of what you're doing? So, like taking the soya bean example, like insect protein powder requires 200 times lesser land and almost 170 times lesser water um, in comparison to a soya bean for production of the same amount of protein powder. And here we are using non-arable land as well. Yep. Yep. So the, the land hardly has any value from a production standpoint. And that is where insect comes, comes in, uh, in replacing these conventional ingredients. Also, the insects that we are cultivating requires food waste. So what we do is we procure our food waste from food processing industries. And approximately 20 kgs of wet waste gets utilized in creating a kg of protein powder. So it's, it's a dual benefit here where we are creating a more sustainable food system and also ensuring waste management because 50% of the world's food waste uh, of the world's waste is organic waste or byproducts. 
And are you also adding some economic benefits for people who are associated in this entire you know, supply chain, right from people who are associated with, you know, food waste till what you're doing? You know, if you can talk about that. Normally, the food waste industry in general has been a pick up and dump kind of industry where you basically bring in a tractor, you go to a processor, you pick up his or her waste and basically just dump it somewhere else in, in some landfill. Hardly composting or biogas generation works at scale because it has its own set of challenges in terms of economic feasibility. So what is happening is the, the, the landfill sizes are growing by the day. The landfills are getting filled. You have, you have to create newer landfills. And the land crunch is happening at the same time. The cities are growing. People are moving in. And that is where food waste being dumped is not exactly a good solution. So that is one challenge. So what we are doing uniquely here is procuring the food waste. We actually don't call the food waste a food waste. It's a raw material for us. It's basically a byproduct or a reject. And by definition, if you look at waste, waste is something which you have not found a value of or say a use of. And we have found that use now. So it's no longer a waste. Waste. And that is where like calling it not a waste makes a lot of sense because it's just another byproduct of the industry. It's similar to a fly ash from a thermal power plant. It's similar to a pet coke from a petroleum industry, like which didn't have a use before. But then it started going to cement industries. That is how the insect agriculture industry is going to solve the waste management problem at scale. Secondly, like the another benefit that we give to our customers, which like who would be the feed manufacturers, right? So currently they are dealing in commodities. Now these commodities, say for example, soya bean or say palm oil, right? They have their own seasonalities. So not like everything is available in the same quality, the same quantity at the same price at every point of time. Now, since we are creating these localized systems, they need not procure their raw material for six months. Like what we do now is going to be two months later, is going to be four months later, is going to be six months later. So because seasonalities don't kick in in our business and that also help create a more localized food system. You are not geopolitically dependent. You are not dependent on cases in, in some other country, which is far, far away from your country, but it still affects you. And that is where inventory management and inventory holding need not be done. The money is just not stuck in the system because you are just holding and storing a lot of raw materials. And that is a benefit for the feed manufacturers in terms of farmers. So consider stream farmers, mm. if they, they use a feed with six to 8% of insect proteins in it, like it's predicted or it's estimated through research that like the productivity benefits is around 15 to 20%. The immunity is higher in, in the shrimps because if you come to think of it from a very first principle perspective, fish and birds were meant to eat chicken, were meant to eat insects in the very beginning. They were not meant to eat soybean and maize. So soybean and maize going to chicken and fish was our doing yeah. and it doesn't give them those balanced nutrients or amino acids or fatty acids which they require for their optimum growth. So it makes a lot of sense to feed them insects. So that, that, those are the, the major benefits that we are giving to, to these people. But one of the things that we are trying out new is like the decentralized model here. So what we are trying to do is not create a captive insect protein factory where the entire thing is being done by one person, the breeding, farming, processing. We are still at the nascent stages there. What we are trying to do is adopt different animal agriculture practices in insect agriculture. Mm -hmm. so say for example, the integrated broiler poultry model, where like these poultry players basically give the one day old chick, the feed, the medicines to farmers who would grow the chicken for them, give it back to them. And ultimately these people would process it and sell it for them. And that is how broiler industry has become 80% and the layer industry has become just 20% in the market because layer doesn't have these integrated systems. Yeah. And the broiler, the broiler poultry model has. So there, there is evidence. We are still not 100% sure that it is going to work in insect agriculture, but it should. And that is what we are willing to try. Great.
So given that you are building your venture in a space which itself is quite nascent, what additional challenges are you facing? And in what ways being one of the first entrants in the space helping you? The challenges were multi multiple. In India is a heavily agrarian country. So we have n number of crops that we grow. And insects have been regarded as pests all the time. But the entomologists in our country were mostly focused on like showing away the insects or killing the insects instead of growing them and cultivating them. Yes, there are evidences of sericulture and apiculture, which is silkworm farming and honeybee farming in India. So there is that talent available, but it's not the same species that we are trying to cultivate. So the mechanism changes, the breeding, the incubation, the farming changes. And like that, we had to figure out on our own. So like the core talent in terms of biology was just not there. Like there were subject matter experts, mm. but not exactly the topic experts that, that we were seeking. So that is the first challenge. The second thing is most of the feed manufacturers in India are out of market. Currently, they have never used insect based products. And though there are evidences at commercial levels in the global markets and also in a lot of research papers in India and abroad, which proves that insect proteins and fats can be used in feed formulations. They are still skeptical whether it would work or not. So a few of them are more confident and forward thinking in comparison to the others, but it would gradually catch up because even they have a requirement of these alternative ingredients. Um, so that is the second challenge. The third challenge is biotech and life sciences in India, like generally doesn't have a lot of good pay scale. So the, the best talent, the cream layer of the talent in India is like maybe taking a biotech degree, but still going and doing a, going and doing a software job at the end of the day. Um, and that is where like we have to basically bring in that compensation, bring in that quality of work, quality of life, like to hire the best talent and attract them in this industry, because like this industry can do wonders if we have the brains and not just the brute. Um, and that, that is, th those were the three major challenges. Uh, money by far is obvious, right? Unconventional industry, primary secondary sector has a capex component. So, and, and it's basically in, in a market which nobody understands. So the thesis has to be built afresh and that actually prolongs the entire like investment duration. Like till that time you do like the first conversation and say do the last conversation with a particular investor. It normally takes a very long period of time for them to build their own thesis in, in this. And that actually is like is a daunting task because you have to educate the customers and the investors both in this process. So those are the challenges. The first mover advantage is that, that we had primarily, like I said, in India is ripe to do insect agriculture and processing. Insects are insects love tropical climate that we have. Insects require food waste or organic byproducts, which we have in abundance. And like our land utility and labor is cheap. So since our cost structures are normally very, very frugal, it makes a lot of sense for us to do the insect agriculture, do the processing and not just ship it in India, but ship it across the world. And like, since we are the first movers here, we are getting that inbound interest from a lot of players who are willing to partner with us, either with money or with like a demand of our products or just simply to tie up with so that they can explore this novel source of proteins and fats for even beyond animal nutrition applications. And that, that is one thing that like that we feel has been a benefit. Another thing is like, if you are the first player in the market, like whatever you do becomes a benchmark. Now, either people are below it or above it. But if you are setting up a very high benchmark there, you are, you stay ahead of the competition as well. And like we are trying to do that in our processes and in our farming and like processing and both our farming. And that is what is going to help us scale it to the global level, sell our products to the global level. So yeah, that is there. Yeah, pretty much it. Great. So building Loopworm is quite different from how new age startups are built. 
mano uh, so lupum requires putting up hard infrastructure solving for supply chain issues both at procurement of raw material and at distribution of finished goods and much more is all of this overwhelming you it's no doubt challenging i've seen my father in the cement industry so i have seen him slog with operations and productions of cement it's a b2b thing and ultimately it's a volume game and that is going to be with us as well so i know that it is going to be challenging cement industry being so established still it faces that challenges right similarly my co-founder abhi has an electrical appliances and electrical wires manufacturing business at home so even he has seen that b2b thing very up, up close even more up close than i have seen it. and he knows the challenges there as well so we knew before entering that it is going to be a challenging field definitely and yes like you mentioned there are n number of challenges right from procurement treating in volumes keeping that consistency of quality supplying it to our customers getting that fair pricing for our products so all of it is challenging but what we are trying to do is just divide each of these steps like and and work it out so instead of rushing through it what we decided was that like let us do it properly and and that is one thing that we did differently like we couldn't have just gone up there and pitched an idea got the money and started working on it like it was a gradual process of 3 years which got us to where we are currently so and it is going to be gradual as well so our journey is going to be much different than say the other vc funded startups in the space but yes we can make good top lines and bottom lines both which is a must for any vc investor yeah sure and then do you think people understand the complexities and the struggles and the challenges that you are going through as you scale this so not all of them so but yeah a few of them they do understand it there are different kinds of nuances as well like we still don't know like what lies ahead so it's a lot of trouble shooting and problem solving on the go and like you cannot approach like 50 people and get solution for it it's just five or 10 people like who you can reach out maybe from an analogous industry or a problem statement and just take their views of how did they get it done in say a tobacco or a wheat or something else right so even you have to find those problem statements which are analogous to your problem statements and that becomes a challenge so yeah it's it's difficult to communicate all the problem statements often people miss the modes that we have it's a series of small 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 moats that is adding up to make a bigger moat because if you don't figure out the breeding you cannot do it if you don't figure out the mortality at the incubation stage it won't work out uh if you are unable to separate the the insect frass which is insect poop and leftover substrate from the insects again it won't work out uh, the quality has to be optimum it should not have those heavy metal contaminations or like toxins or microbial loads which is not acceptable for the industry so that also has to be figured out the processing in itself is unique because that there, there doesn't exist any machinery which processes insects in india yeah so we had to get it done so there are n number of things that we figured out on the way right in, in itself it appears small like give give us 8 months we can figure it out but it's not just about figuring out one problem statement it's a series of like n number of problem statements that you have to figure out simultaneously to make it work out and that that gives us the confidence that yes like we are like we are going to build something phenomenal uh, like what we are, whatever we have achieved till now is going to help us reach there our knowledge and our experiences is going to help us reach there and it's not very easy to to replicate what we are what we are trying to do or what we are doing no that's true that's true and then in terms of because you know you are being first ones and another challenge to be one of the first ones is around attracting the right amount of talent and the right type of talent and also being a startup and which is a startup like yours which needs real real hard work on the ground um, to find alignment uh, amongst those who are, whom those of whom you are attracting up front so how are you going ahead and building your team the you know the core team and also what is more important because you know this is not a space where you will get ready made talent so you will need to nurture talent and for that to happen alignment needs to be there so 
is alignment a better virtue for you than having someone you know which comes from say a sim an industry with some a better background or you think no no that is not going to happen in your case and therefore you know you have to select talent based on some other criteria yeah definitely so alignment versus capability is always a it has to be a mix of both i would say like there has to be a base level a minimum level capability for us to consider anyone that we definitely do but we don't look at any candidate from a capability standpoint only there has to be a very strong alignment with what we are trying to build because it is going to be challenging and if the alignment is not there like those people are not going to stick with us in those tough times and and that is what we believe that like it's okay to have an average capability person but if he or she has a very strong alignment that works the best because what happens is that they are equally motivated to work with you they are more like entrepreneurs in your organization who are working with ownership you can trust them right with both good and bad stuff which is ongoing and that level of trust only comes if there is alignment now, alignment can come in multiple ways uh, alignment can come if you are trying to do something unique alignment can come with sustainability or climate change or some kind of social cause and alignment can also come if uh, there is an enhanced level of trust which is going down the entire organization structure like where like you are very approachable where you don't question somebody if he or she wants to leave right it could be that simple like you trust their judgment right uh, you don't micromanage them and yes so that, that is very much important what we did was instead of floating job applications openly like where we would have to screen like 500 600 thousand applicants we are trying to hand pick them we are doing a basic capability check a lot of reference calls multiple rounds of interviews right just to check whether they are aligned to what we are doing or not or is it just a platform for them to grow and so so that that check is important we are taking help from industry leaders we are still young in our journeys so wherever we feel we take help from like senior hr people senior r&d people senior production and operations people and the best part about the indian ecosystem is people are willing to help if you are trying to do something good if you are trying to like achieve something it's it's not very formal where you have to pay for everything that that like you are getting help of right it's a lot of pro bono thing a very hands on on phone and whatsapp and what not right and and that actually helps so one of the popular things that my mom says at home is mangne se milta hai and here it's about help mangne se milta hai and that, that has actually clicked for us like our first employee it's, it's an amazing story right another iit in like significant pay cut he could he took because he came in before the investment came in and uh, like he's still there and like the level of trust that we have on that particular person is is amazing and that actually helps in the tough times like he is going to do the the job he is assigned and also at the same time courier bhi laga ke aayega right and and that is what it is like so organization first attitude is something that that we look forward to no i i can't agree more with you firm first is i think one of the core principle that everyone should understand and that's a great virtue and it's really great to see how you're building your core team so i think this would be the, my last question so how do you define scale for loop firm and where do you see it in say 2030 so scale for us in the animal nutrition industry is a huge industry no matter how much we produce it's still less for them right so the the scope is immense so there is no tan sam song question here right because it's such a huge, huge industry the nutrient requirement is going to be infinite practically and that is where what we believe is if we have like a scalable system in place if the unit economics work out right it's not a very challenging market because you need not like spend a lot of money on marketing again and again if you have a customer it's a it's almost a customer for life so you need to have that right price point right quality 
the right scale of the product because it has to at least suffice one batch of that particular customer. So here it's not going to be a case where like five, you make five tons, you sell five tons. It has to be a minimum quantity to target a particular customer. So scales for us in 2030, we are targeting like three lakh tons of insect protein. That That is a huge number to be in. We are targeting like 6,000 tons per annum as of now in 2024. And so that's where like we are at, we are targeting like 50 times more in terms of 3 lakh tons of insect protein. Also, what we feel is that there could be other things that can be made with the help of insects. Just to cite examples and it's historical examples. So cockroaches were farmed in China because people were looking to use the iodine that they have to solve respiratory problems. And similarly, silkworm pupa was being used to solve fatty liver issues. So there are, it was a biopharma agent, like historically, but like targeting those applications in the very beginning is not very sensible. It has to be a step-by-step -step process where we target the animal nutrition, which has a, like a proper demand of our product as of now. There are proven results on it. And then ultimately, like when the time is right, we move on to the next stage of products as well. We are scaling on the animal nutrition side building some capabilities on certain value-added products. Thanks, thanks Ankit for your time. It has been lovely talking to you today and hope our listeners enjoy this as well. Have a great 2023 and keep building towards 2030 and beyond. Thank you, Ashish. And th thank you for all the support from Waterbridge and for from you and Karthik. Thank you very much. Thanks. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to That One Idea, a podcast series produced by Waterbridge Ventures, recorded at our studio office in Bangalore. Waterbridge Ventures is a leading early-stage VC fund in India, partnering with mission-oriented founders building game-changing businesses. The fund invests up to $3 million across seed to Series A rounds. With over 32 investments in five years, Waterbridge has backed leading companies like Magic Pin, Unacademy, Doubtnut, Shallow, and City Mall, among many others. With over $250 million in assets under management, Waterbridge also runs India's leading seed investment program called Fast Forward. The Fast Forward program invests up to $1 million in seed stage companies with a seven-day turnaround time to all founder pitches. Head to waterbridge.vc to learn more.